It is good to be here with you today. This first talk is entitled Cultivating Language Arts Preschool Through High School. And it had its inception in a conversation I was having with the superintendent of a small school district in eastern Washington many years ago. I was doing a little work for the school and the teachers. And in between, he and I were visiting and having conversations. And in the course of a conversation, I said to him, I don't like the term language arts. Now, the reason I don't like the term language arts is because it has the ability to conjure up a whole lot of yucky stuff all at once. When you say language arts, people immediately start to think, oh, good heavens, now there's phonics and reading, and then there's uh, phonics and encoding and spelling, and then there's also reading comprehension, and then, of course, there's handwriting, and do you do print or cursive or both or neither? And then, of course, you move into the whole zone of, oh, no, there's grammar. Do you teach grammar? And then composition, what is that? And then you can even go way far out into the the wild reaches of unpleasantness and start talking about public speaking or literary analysis. And it just seems to go on forever and be depressing. And that's why I don't like the term language arts. So I told him this, and he responded by saying, well, that's because you don't know what they are. <laughs> so I took a little humble pill, and I said, OK, so what are they? And he said, in, in a more classical sense, there are only four of them. And they are listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And the latter two, reading and writing, are predicated or dependent on the former two, listening and speaking. And then I think he said the most intelligent thing I have ever heard anyone in a public school ever say to me. He said, one of our problems in education is that we we work really hard on teaching reading and writing because we assess those things. And we give short shrift to teaching listening and speaking because we don't test those things. And this was very much in line with all of what I had been thinking. And the whole conversation evolved into kind of a line of content that, that affected our, our corporate identity. When we redid our, our logo and tagline and all that, you'll notice on the logo, it says, listen, speak, read, write, think. So I'm going to go over these four arts of language, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, and five developmental levels. So I will talk then about preschool, which in my view are children about three and a half to five and a half or six, plus or minus a bit. Primary grades, which in my way of thinking would be kids about six to eight, maybe nine. Then you'd have upper elementary or elementary, which in my thinking would be kids about eight or nine up to say 10 or 11, and then middle school and high school. I really don't like grade levels, so I tend not to think or talk in terms of grade levels, but most people do. So preschool, K-1-2, 3-4-5, middle and high. Before we dive into that, though, I would like to uh, make a few connections between these four arts of language so that you get a good sense of how interdependent they are and how reading and writing very much are predicated upon listening and speaking. So we think, obviously, the first connection that's clear as day to anyone would be listening and speaking. Right? It is extremely unlikely, if not impossible, for a child to say or use a word in their speaking that they have not heard. Right? That is the primary way in which we acquire vocabulary, and in many cases, the sole way that we acquire vocabulary for the first whole couple developmental periods of life. Now, when kids are older, they may get to a point where they read a word, try to figure out how it sounds, and possibly try to use that word in a conversation in some form. But I think we can all agree that that first level of interdependence between listening and speaking is very, very significant. Now, one thing that's interesting to me is, of course, words. And in English, we have two words that are almost synonymous but not quite. Hear and listen. Hearing and listening. Not quite synonymous. What's the difference? Well, hearing is accidental. Everybody hears. Unless you have a, a hearing impediment or you're deaf, you hear 
whether you want to or not. I always thought it would be handy if God had given us the, the ability to close our ears the way we can close our eyes. That would be handy. But I guess survival meant that it would be better off if we couldn't. I'm not sure. But this idea of hearing is, is accidental. You hear all the time. But listening is more of a transitive verb. It requires an object. It's an active thing. You listen to someone. You listen for something, right? There's a, an intentionality there. The same thing with speaking and talking, talking and speaking. Everybody talks. Unless you have a neurological impediment, everyone talks. But speaking has that, that intentionality again. You speak to someone. You speak about something. There's a purposefulness in speaking. So I would argue that while we hear and talk, which are kind of natural functions, accidental, everybody does them unless there's a handicap there, listening and speaking are skills. And in such, these can be cultivated. These can be developed. So we start then with this idea of listening and speaking. Now, uh, what's another connection? Well, one that a lot of people don't realize is the connection between listening and reading comprehension. Right? So why is this a connection? Well, when you see a word, what do you basically do? You try to figure out what that word is and say it to yourself and then determine if you've ever heard that word before. And if you have heard that word before, then you probably are right in what you think it is. If you haven't heard the word before, you don't have any way of knowing if that's an actual English word or not. I'll give you an example. Let's say you're a little kid, and you're reading along something, and you come to this word, and you try to sound it out. Saligha. 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 There is no such thing as a sligaha. How do you know there's no such thing as a sligaha? You've never, ever heard anyone say it. You've never heard that word. Therefore, it doesn't exist in the set of known English words in the database of your mind. So you say, well, it can't be sligaha. It must be something else. So you stare at it a little bit longer, and you rustle your brain, and then you notice. And you say, ha-ha, that's that E-I-G-H. That's one of them A sounds. So you try again, and you say, slay, slay, slay. It's a slay. And you're so excited because you just figured it out, right? You remember learning to read a little bit like that? You're so excited. Now, that only works if you already know what a sleigh is. If you don't know what a sleigh is, well, then you wouldn't know what it would be. You could say sleigh, but it wouldn't make any sense to you, right? Now, how, as a child, in this modern world, would you learn what a sleigh is? We're a little short on sleighs in Oklahoma here, right? I mean, you might see a fake sleigh with a fake Santa in a mall, at Christmas or something, but I try to stay as far away from anything like that as possible, it's most likely you would have learned the word slay, not in daily conversation, but in a book, or a story, or a poem, or a picture book, or a song, some source of language that was, that was not just in the common everyday conversation. And that word slay, with a picture or a context, would then enter the database of language of your mind, and that's how you would know what it is. If that has not happened, you can read along and you can figure out it says slay, but it might as well be a sleigh. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. So reading comprehension is very, very dependent on auditory comprehension and the vocabulary that you have built up over those years of acquiring language information. That's another example of the interaction there. Uh, how about the third way? We would think about reading and speaking, right? So when you read, what do you do? You're basically talking to yourself, aren't you? you you're looking, and you, you, you see a few words, and you say them to yourself, right? And young children tend to do better when they can talk out loud to themselves, because then they can hear what they are reading, and it's by hearing that they actually understand. Then as they get a little bit older, 
we can help them learn the idea of reading and hearing, but only doing it inside your mind, by right? internally audiating the words. Uh, but even so, oftentimes you'll discover, even kids, you know, 9, 10, 11 years old, they'll actually understand things better if they read them out loud. So we see then that, that reading and speaking is going to support and build each other in this way. Then, of course, you might look at the relationship between speaking and writing, right? So if you want to write something, what do you have to do? Again, you have to talk to yourself. If you go write an email, the first thing your brain starts doing is telling you what you have to say. And it happens very, very quickly for us as adults that we, we think, hear, listen, and write, and it's a very short process. But for children, it's going to be slower and much longer. In fact, to write anything at all, right, there are some prerequisites. To write something, first, there has to be an idea. If there's no idea, there's nothing to write. Okay? The idea can pre-exist inside the memory or imagination, or the idea can pre-exist outside the memory or imagination. I'll give you an example. If I ask you to write about the last uh, trip you took with your family or someone, right? I'm asking you to rely on your memory and imagination for the ideas that would record some part of that experience. Right? If I said, please uh, write a little bit about this room, then I'm asking you to go immediately to your environment and notice things and draw things out. Do you see the difference there? Okay, so that's, that's one factor. The other thing is that ideas can pre-exist in words, or they can pre-exist not so much in words, but in sensory impressions. Right? Give you another example. If I said, uh, write about your dog or cat or pet that you have, I'm, I'm asking you to take kind of a, an experience and translate that into words. Right? You could probably tell me you know, very easily in words what, how old the dog is or what breed the dog is or when you got the dog. But the experience of playing with the dog, that doesn't really pre-exist in words. It pre-exists in this sensory, visceral, emotional collection of feelings and thoughts and ideas. Right? And those have to be translated into words. Whereas, if I read you an Aesop fable and said, please tell me an Aesop fable that you just heard, well, that pre-existed in words, right? Okay, so wherever it comes from, whether it's inside the mind or external, whether it's in words or not in words, wherever you find an idea, then the thing you have to do is speak or re-speak that idea into existence. That's what makes it concrete, real, transmissible, usable, is you speak it into existence. Then, of course, you have to hear what you just said. And I'm sure you've noticed, if you spent any time with children at all, that they can sometimes talk and not hear what they just said. In fact, I suspect I used to be like that when I was younger. I could talk and not hear what I said. And so there's a skill involved in listening to yourself think, in listening to yourself speak. There's an attentiveness that needs to be cultivated for that to happen well. Once you've spoken into existence and heard what you said, then you have to remember what you heard yourself say to yourself long enough to go and wrestle the mechanical information, how to make letters, how to spell words, how to get them on the paper, right? Which, that activity happens in an entirely different part of the brain, right? And you've got to hold that sequence of words that holds that idea into existence long enough to wrestle the information onto the page or the keyboard or whatever. And then you've got to go to the next idea in the sequence and repeat the whole thing. And if there's a breakdown anywhere in that process, what happens? You lose your, quote, train of thought, and you have to start all over again. Find your idea, speak it, hear it, hold it, wrestle it, and move on. I, I often you know, reflect on the fact that writing is so insanely complex, it's borderline a miracle that anybody can do it, right? It's so incredibly complex. 
And then, of course, you could go to one more step here, and that would be talk about the uh, relationship between reading and writing. In one obvious way, reading helps build vocabulary, build fluency, build language patterns. But on the other side, if you write something, what do you have to do? Read it and be sure that's what you wanted it to be. And I'm sure we have all experienced that case where we wrote something and then everyone said, uh, not quite, and then change some words or change some phrasing. And that itself is a skill that has to be developed over time. And I'm sure you've seen children who write the thing and say, I'm done, goodbye, and they didn't even read it. And it could be missing words. It could not make sense. Well, that's probably a different problem. But you know, there's that attentiveness to what you've already done that makes your, your writing dependent on your proof reading, in a way. Do you see that? I'm sure we could draw more lines between these four arts of language. I think that gives you a sense, though, of how integrally connected and interconnected and interdependent these things are. And so what we want to do, I believe, is not give short shift to listening and speaking so that we actually get better reading and writing down line. So let's take a look at the preschool period. So again, children about three and a half to five and a half plus or minus a little bit. Uh, children come into readiness for various things at different speeds. Ages are very approximate developmentally. And we very often see that many girls kind of hit readiness for things a little bit before the boys. The boys have other advantages. Um, but from the kind of academic language art side, the girls seem to have a little bit slight, uh, faster ability to acclimate themselves to these activities. But for me, you know, preschool is, is before school. So the whole idea of preschool curriculum makes no sense at all. Curriculum is for schools. These are preschool. But what do you do with young children? Well, let's take a look at listening. Now, this may be a little bit counterintuitive for you, but I would argue if you want very good language development in a child, the most important thing to do with preschool age children is music. And there are a few reasons for this. Number one, children are very tuned in to music, and they're very tuned in to tonal differentiation. In fact, all of language is based on tonal differentiation. If, if I were speaking to you and I said, hohoya, you wouldn't be hearing language. You would just be hearing some tones, right? But if I kept doing it, hohoya, 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 you'd get the idea. Those are hohoya, right? Glasses. Now, that is not a word in any language that I'm aware of, but <laughs> that's the process by which you start to make connections. Then the next time you hear that, combination of tones and sounds, you associate it with the idea of glasses, right? So all languages tonal and all languages are different combinations of going up tones, going down tones, harsh tones, soft tones, loud tones, softer tones, uh, short tones, long tones, right? Articulated tones, unarticulated tone, right? It's all just this mishmash. And that's part of the amazingness of language is that people do this incredibly, insanely complicated thing called talk, and other people can understand it. it it's really miraculous in a way. So why music? Because music attunes children to tonal differentiation. And I would recommend that you focus on music in a very particular and effective way, not accidental. Most music that we get is accidental. We go to a store, we go to a restaurant, we go to a gas station, we turn on something and it's just in the environment and it's, it's just there, but there's no focus on it, right? And that's not nearly as beneficial to children. So what I like to suggest is that you would take a very short piece of music, maybe two or three minutes, so short, and ideally, it would be not vocal, so no words, not a song. Take an instrumental piece of music. And ideally, it would be a great piece of a piece of music. And you don't need to know a lot. You don't have to have a background in music. You just have to know a few names. Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Handel, throw in Vivaldi, and you're good for life, right? And so you would grab maybe three minutes of one of the best pieces by Bach. And then what you would do is play that piece of music three or four or five times a day for a whole week. 
that same three minutes. So with three to five times a day for a week, you would get somewhere between 20 and 30 repetitions of that same three minutes. Now, what will happen when a young child hears the same three minutes of music 20 or more times in a week? They memorize it. They know exactly what's coming. Now, when you know what's coming, two really interesting things happen. Number one, you increase your attentiveness. Right? You pay more attention to something that you expect to happen because you're waiting for that thing that you're expecting. The second thing is that you increase joy because the fulfillment of expectation creates a little burst of joy. Right? And this happens with music. It also happens with little storybooks. Right? Have you ever noticed young children are very happy to listen to the same book again? and again, and again, and you are just tired of it. And they will say, read it again. And you think, I just read this to you three times today, five times yesterday. Why? Well, there's so many things that happen. One thing that happens is they know it's going to happen. And so when it happens, they're very happy. They know Ping in the beautiful Yangtze River. They know he's going to get a little spank on his back and get into the boat on time at the end of the story and learn his lesson. But they want to feel that. They want to see that. They want to re-experience that. This is why we all are OK watching superhero movies, right? Spoiler alert, good guys win in the end. Like, <laughs> did you not know that before you walked in? Why do you like the movie? Because you like to see what you expect to happen. Then sometimes they make a superhero movie where the good guys don't win in the end, and everyone is really angry about this. <laughs> Then they have to make a sequel so that you guys win, which is their plan all along to sell you twice as many movies. But so, um, so this happens. Another thing that happens when you read the same book to children again and again is they understand a little bit more each time. The context becomes a little bit clearer. Something that they heard or noticed um, in the words or the picture is new, and it adds to the f more fulfilling understanding of what's going on. So as they get repetition, their comprehension increases, the fulfillment of expectation, the attentiveness, and the joy. And that's why it's better to buy children's books and have them so you can read them 100 times than to have to always send them back to the library, and then you don't. So building a good library is very, very valuable, especially if you're going to be a grandparent. <laughs> then you have the best books. <laughs> So this reading uh, stories and music, this is at the foundation, really, I would say, of all of our language development, listening, speaking, reading, writing, because we're starting right there in the most important way. Now, another thing that you'll notice is that young children can overhear conversations, right? And they don't understand everything. But we don't filter or censor the language that they're exposed to. This is why younger children in a family very often will develop a more advanced vocabulary more quickly than older children. Because your oldest kid, you talk to him like a kid. But then you're, that kid's six, seven years old, and you got another kid who's two or three, and they're overhearing the six, seven year old, and it just keeps going up and up. So there's a marvelous trickle down effect that happens with larger families where you often see younger children uh, just acquire language ability much more effortlessly in many ways through that environmental factor. And you know, people kind of you know worry, okay, if I if I talk over a child, if I read something they don't understand, would that be bad? Well, little kids don't understand almost everything anyway. <laughs> I mean we don't we don't worry about it. And so then occasionally you realize, oh, that child understood that thing. They'll use a word that kind of surprises you. My five-year-old granddaughter was watching Dr. Doolittle with me a couple weeks ago, and she said, is he a zoologist? <laughs> Where does a five-year-old get zoologist, right? But then I realized her older brother had been telling a joke that involved a zoologist. And when a 10-year-old knows a joke, they have to tell it to everybody many times, <laughs> right? And so she just overheard this joke, and then she started telling the joke, and boom, she's got zoologist in her vocabulary. So there's a marvelous trickle-down effect. Now, the other thing that is extremely important at this developmental stage is to minimize screen 
based entertainment technology. Now, I'm not opposed to all technology. I'm actually in favor of things like modern dentistry, airplanes, and audiobooks. I love those things. But the problem with screen-based entertainment is that it is visually hyper-simulating, and kids actually start to tune out the world around them. And so they become visually over-engaged, auditorily under-engaged, and they don't get the advantages of the richer auditory environment. There's also all sorts of other reasons why the American Pediatric Association uh, tries to basically say, minimize screens in young children's life. There's really nothing good that comes from it. Now, I understand that you find it convenient to put on some innocuous little thing like Little Bear or something and let your little kid watch a screen while you go wash your hair. I, I wouldn't fault anyone for that. My kids do it to the grandchildren. You know, and as long as it's Little Bear or something in that zone, okay, it's fine, you know. Um, although I would point out your parents didn't have to have a screen to, for you, for them to wash their hair. So, you know, but that at best, screens at that age are, are babysitting. But at worst, they can be highly addictive, overstimulating, and interfere with a normal language development uh, in children. So, minimizing screen-based entertainment technology. Now, let's talk a little bit about speaking. Because again, this is intentional speaking, not just talking your ear off, which many children will do. So how do we do this in a more intentional way? Well, the first thing would be memorizing simple poems, things like nursery rhymes or songs. And I, I, I'm sad that we've lost the nursery rhyme culture. You know, probably as recently as 50 years ago, certainly 80 years ago, pretty much every home would have had a mother goose collection and would have read those little ditties to children again and again and again, so much so that those children would start to memorize those things and then say them back to you. And so they would memorize almost without effort. They would expand their active vocabulary through memorizing simple poems, songs, ditties like that. And you think of the ones, you know, things like Jack Spratt could eat no fat, his wife could eat no lean, right? Well. That's different than what you would hear in normal life. It's got a word you might not hear, lean. It's got a, a grammatical or, or linguistic pattern that is specific and different than you might hear in just normal conversation. So as children start to memorize language, they actually build their language database and it helps move words from the passive vocabulary, i.e. I can look at that or hear it and kind of know what it means, into their active vocabulary. I can use that word. I could speak it or later write it correctly because I know what it means. And so there's a very significant value in this type of thing. And again, I'm very sad that so many parents don't have the nursery rhyme culture at home. They don't understand the value of memorizing these little songs and ditties. Um, a lot of people used to memorize stuff kind of as a part of their culture, scripture, or poetry of their own subculture. And now that's kind of dying off as well. So I think it's very, very valuable to encourage everyone to um, you know, work this into a young child's life by a mother goose treasury. In fact, John Sr., uh, who wrote a book called The Restoration of Christian Culture, he actually said, if you grow up on Mother Goose, you can love Willie Shakespeare. And one of the reasons is that a lot of Mother Goose is in that same rhythmic pattern, that iambic pattern of poetry that Shakespeare uses. So there's this artistic consonance between the simplest and the highest that, that builds. Um, children of a young age will have the habit of talking to themselves. Have you ever noticed this? Right? Leave a little four-year-old on their own and spy on them, right? And they will have a conversation with themselves or with something they're playing with or some imaginary thing. And this is a hugely important developmental stage. Talking to yourself is actually the way you learn how to hear what you are thinking. Right? Because when you talk to yourself, the fuzzy idea you have becomes more concrete. Right? The language makes it more real. And so uh, having an environment where young children are free 
to talk to each other and talk to themselves is extremely valuable. And when you put young children in an environment and say, sit down, be quiet, and only speak when you have permission, it's almost like saying, turn off your brain for most of the day here. It's, it's not a good language development environment. In fact, I ran a preschool for a few years, and uh, I had 12 children in my group, uh, all between the ages of three and a half to five and a half, and then maybe four to six later on. And I would put them in a little circle and ask them a question, and I would let them all talk to me at the same time. You would have thought, man, he's running a zoo. Nobody can understand anything. But you see, I knew it was more important for them to talk than for anyone to hear what they were saying. Right? So that idea. The other thing is that you notice that both um, memorized language in the form of uh, nursery rhymes, poems, songs, etc., and self-talk cultivates the imagination. Because when you say something, there's an image that goes with it. And so you're reinforcing the imaging of the thing. And the image gets clearer and clearer, just like when they hear the story again and again, they start to understand it and see more detail in all of it. Now, let's think a little bit about reading. We don't consider it necessary, at least we should not consider it necessary, to teach five-year-olds to read. Right? And the one thing I would say about this is that we do potentially way more damage to young children by forcing them to read too early than we would by just waiting until they show readiness and then teaching them to read. Uh, and sadly, our, our modern education system has kind of been failing in teaching reading for a long time. And so their strategy has been to push it early and earlier. Oh no, our third graders don't read well, what should we do? Force it harder in second grade. Oh no, it's not working. What should we do? Force it harder in first grade. Oh no, it's not working. What should we do? Force it in kindergarten. Pre-K reading curriculum. This should not exist, right? And the problem is that if you take a child who's developmentally unready to read and you try to force this thing, you will fail and they will hate it. And then when they're a little bit older and maybe they are more developmentally ready, they still have a year or two of hating reading that you've got to overcome. It would be wiser to just wait until they were seven or eight and then do it, and then they could do it more easily and it can happen faster without this. But you know, I meet a lot of young moms, even my own adult children who have young children, that have anxiety about teaching reading to very young children. And so I'm constantly coaching people. But you know, some countries that have, in many ways, better educational results than we do, I would point to Scandinavian countries specifically, they really don't push reading or writing much until the children are in that seven to eight year old zone, because then you have developmental readiness. The other problem you have is that, again, girls very often show a readiness at an earlier age than boys. And so then you're comparing boys and girls and you think, oh no, I'm failing the boys or there's a problem when it's just the normal process. So that would be my preface to talking about reading. But what do you do with young children is they're reading with their ears, right? And, and that's a weird thing because we define reading as looking at stuff with our eyes, decoding it, figuring out what it is, and knowing what it says. But if you think a little broader, well, blind people don't do that. They read with their fingers sometimes. Why can't you also read with your ears, right? And so that is why reading allowed to children at a level above their own decoding skills is important through all of childhood. And so you would start that with young children. We generally start with picture books. And here's an interesting thing. I, I recently discovered why picture books are very important and why as kids get a little bit older, there are fewer pictures, but illustrations are very helpful. You know how kids love those illustrations? Like, frustrates me. I will read the kids a bedtime story. I got them all in bed, the grandchildren, right? They're all in bed, and I read a book. And if they think there's a picture on the page, out of bed, standing around, have to see the picture. Can't possibly not see the picture. Why? I figured it out. The way that children check their own comprehension is to compare what's going on in their imagination from the words 
with what they see on the page. And if it matches up, that's reassuring to them. It's like, OK, I knew what was going on. I understand this. That confirms it. If the picture doesn't match, that is very frustrating. In fact, I had a book, and I ended up throwing it away because I determined it was evil. <laughs> It was a good book, but the way that that particular edition had pictures that weren't happening in the story until the next page or two. So you're reading, they're looking at the picture. Why is that that? Why is, that, why is he doing that? Well, I don't know. We'll find out. But why? Right? It's, it's incongruent. So, or one of my biggest pet peeves is, is illustrators who design book covers who clearly did not read the book. <laughs> this, this should be a crime. But the reason it's disturbing to children is because it, it is a dissonance between what they believe they should be seeing in their mind and the picture. So the pictures are very valuable and very important. And I recently was interested to learn that Charles Dickens was extremely concerned about the quality of the pictures in A Christmas Carol. And uh, that that was very, very important to him in the publishing of this book. And he basically risked his whole fortune on publishing A Christmas Carol. And it turned out to be the most successful thing he ever did. But uh, then, of course, if you've got older children, it's very good for younger children to overhear you reading higher level stuff to older children. And I've, I've always been fascinated that, you know, if I'm reading to grandchildren and they're 5 and 8 and 11, and you read a book that's really written for a five-year-old, the eight and 11 are very happy to sit there. And if you read a book to an 11-year-old, the younger ones are very happy to sit there and listen. So it's this great richness, this great banquet feast. Nobody can possibly eat all of it. They can't absorb all of it, but they can always absorb what they're ready for. And that's the best way to think about reading with young children. Writing is not something you worry about with preschool age children. But what will happen is they will pick up a utensil and try to make marks on something because they have seen you do that, right? And they're just imitating. So let me find something that looks like something like that and make marks on something that looks like I could make marks on it. Hopefully, it's not a Sharpie on the wall. That's what you're trying to avoid. But they will show you when they're ready to do this. And then what's the most important thing? I would argue holding the thing correctly. Because if you, at a young age, learn how to hold the crayon or the pencil or the pen correctly, then that's going to be a habit that serves you for years, for your whole life. If you don't help children learn to do that, they can develop a weird way of holding it, and that will handicap them for their whole life. And so, you know, without pestering them, you just keep showing, keep showing, keep showing. Children have an instinctive desire to do things the right way. Right? But if you don't show them and kind of insist that they work a little bit harder to do it, they can become lazy like any of us. And so this would be the most important thing I would suggest when it comes to preschoolers and writing. The other kind of funny thing is that you can teach children to spell words before they can read any words. In fact, I think one of the first words that many children learn to spell is ice. Because dad will say to mom something like, do we have any of that um, I-C-E-C-R-E-M stuff? And it doesn't take too many repetitions until the kid figures out, that's that stuff I really like, right? Uh, so they will be able to identify and, and spell words. So I ran my little preschool for a while. And I had a lot of very young children who were years away from reading. right? I, I just knew it by looking at their eyes. This kid is not going to read for two or three years. but. All of these children could spell dozens of words because we did it verbally. So you start with little three-letter words, M-O-M-O-M, -O -M -O -M, or D-A-D. -D. I taught them all the sign language alphabet so there would be a kinesthetic element to fit into the auditory and verbal element. And so uh, they can learn to spell dozens of words before they can even read them or before they can even recognize printed letters you know, efficiently. But here's what's so interesting. If you already know how to spell a word and then you see the letters, you will read it much faster. You will recognize it almost immediately. And that's true all the way up. 
So spelling is also a way to make reading go better. But don't limit yourself to think that spelling has to be on paper or in a workbook or whatever. All right, let's move on to the primary level. So in my thinking, these are children who would be kind of entering the school age at five and a half or six, and this would last until they're, say, you know, eight and a half or nine, maybe a little older, depending on maturity. Most of the things that I would recommend at this age are the same as for younger children, but just with a little greater uh, quantity, a little greater sophistication. So you're going to uh, continue to listen to music, but you can expand the length of time. So rather than a short two or three minutes, you could bump it up to four or five minutes and then ask the children, perhaps, to even close their eyes and listen. And when it's over, ask them what they noticed or what they thought or what they saw. Right? And so bring some awareness and contemplation to the process of listening. Same thing, you've got your picture books and storybooks, but you're increasing the length of time. I was reading uh, to a four-year-old grandchild, and he picked the book, he brought it over, I started reading it. It was a really sophisticated book. I thought, there's not a chance he understands what's really happening here. But he liked it, and he liked looking at the pictures. And we got about two-thirds of the way through the book, and he said, OK, I'm done. <laughs> now, the normal inclination would be, well, we have to finish the book. No, he got what he needed at that moment, and it was time to go get another book or play with Legos or whatever. So this idea that you can read above their, their comprehension level is fine, but then respond to where they're at as well. Again, you want to minimize screen-based entertainment, and I would even say educational technology. I am very, very cautious, even concerned, about the prevalence of screen-based programs that are trying to teach reading and spelling. All the research, all of the research shows very clearly that kids learn to read and learn to spell better if they do it on paper, and yet, all of the big money and all of the big you know, influence is trying to create this paperless classroom. And we have to equip every child in school with a tablet or a Chromebook all the way down to first grade. We won't know the damage that we're doing until it's way too late to undo this damage. But uh, again, uh, the hypervisual -stimu hyper stimulation and then just the fact that two-dimensional versus three-dimensional things are different in the way it's stored in the brain. So I would continue to minimize that. With speaking now, you can get into longer poems, right? You can go beyond nursery rhymes. Six-year-olds can actually learn pretty long poems if you break them into smaller chunks. Um, I am also uh, of the belief that if you have a religious tradition that uh, encourages it, memorizing scripture is not just valuable from, say, a spiritual or religious perspective, but from an actual language development perspective. And if you look at pretty much the whole history of the world, people have been memorizing their sacred scriptures wherever in the world uh, at a young age and throughout pretty much their whole childhood to great intellectual and linguistic benefit. Um, another thing that we can uh, do is memorized prayers. I think these are also very valuable from, from many perspectives, and some traditions have more of those than others. But there is that, that beauty of the language that flows through in the tradition that is in and of itself of value from a language development. And the more you say something, the more those words move from your passive to your active vocabulary. Um, another idea that you can start to work in pretty effectively around this age is the idea of narration as it was uh, described by Charlotte Mason in her books on home education. Any Charlotte Mason readers? Okay, so not enough, but that's okay. You can, <laughs> you can get the book and read. But Charlotte Mason had this idea that it would be very beneficial for children to have kind of a time to formally narrate back experiences that they have had. So for example, you make cookies with a six-year-old, the cookies are in the oven, take a few minutes and invite that child to tell you what did you do in the process of making cookies. And you can prompt them, what did we do first? What did we do after that? What did we do after that? What did we do after that? Narration essentially means going through time, relating things through time. Or if you take a little nature walk, you could come back and say, hey, what do you remember that we saw on our walk? Right? Uh, or you read a story to them, 
before you run off and play Lego, say, oh, let's just uh, give this child a couple of minutes. Tell me back what you heard about this story. And this does many valuable things. Number one, it cultivates attentiveness to detail. When you get a habit of having a child do this on a regular basis, they start instinctively remembering more things because they know there's an expectation that they're going to use that information by relating it to you. Uh, another thing is that it just creates fluency in speaking and relating uh, things that are processes into words, into sequences. And oftentimes you do things that have uh, vocabulary that's maybe a little less usual than the normal day of vocabulary. You go on Nature Walk, you find a dead cicada thing, which I found this morning near the swimming pool. Uh, a hollowed out exoskeleton is what it was. So, you know, I pointed this out. Well, cicada, hollow, exoskeleton. These aren't necessarily words that come up unless you have one handy, right? <laughs> uh, so, so then those words make it into the active vocabulary the more they're used. So there's that advantage as well. Um, another thing that's kind of similar, but more on the inventive creative side rather than the memory based side, would be children dictating stories. So they dictate a story and then you write it down as they dictate it. Preferably, you do this on a large whiteboard. And I would suggest that if you are at home with children, the single most valuable next thing you should buy if you don't have one already is a large whiteboard. And I'm talking six feet at least. And if you have a little money, get the magnetic kind so you can stick stuff up there. And this is tremendously valuable when you're teaching anything, but it's really good for children to be able to see in big screen, right, their words going into script. Right? And then as they get older around this time, they may be able to copy that onto a piece of paper. So they're actually doing the thinking of the story and the writing of the story, but they don't have to do both of those things at the same time and get overwhelmed. Um, I am at such an age that I do not need a single additional coffee cup or thing in my life. I just don't need things. So all of my family knows I don't want things. If it has to be disposable or consumable, or I just don't want it. So I get a lot of hot sauce, and my favorite gifts for Father's Day and birthday and stuff is books by grandchildren. I, all my grandchildren are very young. They don't write books, but they dictate stories. Their parents write them down, and then they illustrate it. And so I get a book written and illustrated by whoever, right? Usually, they're, you know, most of them are boys, and so these are usually kind of bloody books with <laughs> you know, dragons and battles going on or pirate ships and, and all that. But yeah, that's par for the course. So dictating stories is a good precursor then, of course, to writing as well. With reading now, you are generally thinking, OK, it's time to introduce a phonics program. right? You think about, OK, school age. And again, I would reiterate that readiness trumps curriculum every single time. You can have the best curriculum in the world, and you can spend as much time as you can spare, and you can really work hard to teach a six-year-old to read and still fail. I know, I've done this, right? You can also notice, especially in a larger family, you can have a kid who turns six and just one day you realize this kid's reading stuff all over the place. And you didn't even teach them, they just suck it out of the air. So, you know, in many ways, reading is much more a brain function than it is an academic thing that can be taught and learned on demand. And we wanna keep that in mind. But when you perceive readiness, you find a phonics program. All the juries are in now. Even the, the progressive liberal educator types have admitted that phonics is an important part of teaching children to read. It was thrown out for many years. And you had these iterations of look, say method and whole language method. And, and, and then what you get is kids guessing at words all the time. And that's not helpful. And there are super cheap, easy, little, here's a book called How to Teach Your Child to Read in 100 Easy Lessons. And I know people have used that, and it worked very well. You can also buy very elaborate kits of, of hundreds of dollars of cards and pieces and all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, where do you, where's your range? A and I think you do find that some things work better for some children, because some children are just more organized. Give me the facts. I love it. Other kids are like, you have to catch their imagination. So it's a good thing we have this wide variety of things available. But again, 
the magic is not in the curriculum. <laughs> the, the magic is in the timing and the interaction, the human interaction that you, you're able to give. And that's, of course, why so many children learn to read better and faster from parents at home in a one-on-one -on -one situation than in a group where it's much harder for one teacher to connect with 20-some kids in the way they would best benefit from that. Um, also, you're thinking about, OK, continuing to read with your ears. This is often the age range at which kids can start to use audiobooks. You got an old phone. It's not connected to anything like the internet, but you can load audiobooks on there, right? Uh, you've, you've got audio. Maybe some of you actually have cars with CD players. I don't know. that. <laughs> They do exist. I've seen CD players. but uh, So this idea, though, of, of supplementing your reading aloud to them with audiobooks. And this can be very, very powerful at cultivating language and increasing comprehension. And again, kids will sometimes want to hear the same audiobook again and again. Grandchildren get in the car with me. First thing is, Grandpa Zorro. <laughs> I've heard Zorro. I can narrate Zorro back to you. but. Why? Because still, even at that age of 10 or 11, they gain a little more understanding every repetition. So repetition and attentiveness are very connected. All right, with writing, now you're starting into probably letter formation. Again, you want to get that good, correct grip on the utensil. And the thing I would point out here is the most important thing about learning to write letters is to have the right stroke order. Right. Do you remember those little strips we had in school? And it had the whole alphabet. And it had those little tiny red arrows with little numbers. One, two, three. Do this first, then do this. That is really important. And that's not arbitrary. Those little strips are designed because people, you know, for a long time, realized this is a better way to make this letter than any other way. And that is extremely important. And then if you get a child who's not doing that, they get an inconsistent or awkward way of making a letter, that's a handicap for a very long time. And unfortunately, you know, uh, I would say that many schools are either unwilling or probably unable to give the individual attention to focus on how to hold the thing properly and how to make the letters properly. Uh, and so the attitude is, well, I can't do that. Or it doesn't matter. Let them hold it and do it any way they want. And then you get kids making an S from the bottom up. Or, oh, think if you're a mildly dyslexic kid and you're trying to copy a B or a D, and your method is to make a stick and then figure out which way the ball goes. I mean, it's Murphy's Law of Dyslexia. You'll be wrong 100% of the time, right? So, but if you learn the stroke order, it's a different kinesthetic motion to make a B and a D. And there's even some good research and argument to be made for teaching cursive first, because children actually make curves and circles before they make straight lines. Now, that's a little bit controversial, and you can look into it if you want to. There's some, some methods and, and good reasons. And I would point out, 150 years ago, everybody learned cursive first. Nobody learned to print first. They all learned cursive first. It wasn't until the ubiquity of the typewriter that someone said, oh, well, children have to learn to read type. They better print. They forgot there had been typed stuff before the typewriter. For a few hundred years, and everybody learned to read it, OK. All right, but uh, then you would probably move from letter formation right into simple copy work. And this is not requiring a child to figure out what to write, but it's helping build their ability to put words and sequences of words and sentences along with capitals and punctuation and details. Copy work, simple copy work, is extremely valuable in three ways. Number one, and most importantly, it builds stamina. Uh, some of you may have bumped into a young child who um, can write, but writes a few words and says, oh, my hand is too tired. I can't do this anymore. right? And they fall off the chair and demonstrate why they're so exhausted. Well, what the problem is, is it's requiring a set of neural 
facility and muscular activity that isn't required on a daily basis. So yeah, they are tired because they're not used to it. Just like some of us, if you said, go run a 10K race and we tried to do that tomorrow, we might die, <laughs> right? We would be tired and give up. What would be the method? Do a little bit, recover, do a little bit more, recover, do a little bit more. And I'm sure that anyone, if we put our mind to it, could build up over a period of time to running a race like that. Kids are the same way of putting words on paper. So you start with a short period, maybe it's a sentence, and then maybe it's 20 words, and maybe you build up to 50 words a day or 100 words a day. And over the years, you keep going. Unfortunately, schools today don't or can't do this. And so the whole idea of copying as a way to learn how to put words on paper and build stamina has been thrown out. Now, what happens with stamina? What happens if you trained yourself to run? And then you could. You would have confidence. And that's the second thing that copy work does, is it builds confidence for kids. They know they can put words on paper. Like my little five-year-old granddaughter who was really afraid to put her face in the water. And when she finally got it and swam three feet under the water for the first time, the next thing, she did that about four times, and then she said, I love swimming. I always want to be swimming. I want to swim all night. <laughs> I don't, but. So that confidence kind of explodes, right? And then the third thing that happens is a, attentiveness to detail about what is correct, right? Because there are correct ways to do things. And unfortunately, the way that writing is taught in many you know, first, second grade classrooms I have seen is they kind of give the kids some blank paper. Actually, two thirds of it is totally blank, and then there's two or three lines along the bottom. They say, draw a picture and write something about the picture. right? And then the teachers, for some reason, are, are coached not to edit or correct or do anything except affirm. Great, wonderful, fantastic, so creative, love it. right? which I'm not totally opposed to, but when you're saying this is great, the kid himself knows, no, this isn't great. I don't know what to do. I'm just floundering. But you tell them it's great. It's disingenuous, right? Children want to learn to do things the proper way. So when we let them copy, then they're actually patterning the correct way to do things and becoming more attentive to the way of doing that. All right, let's move on, and we will notice that many of these things are the same, but we're just upping the sophistication, right? So now with kids in elementary, uh, they can listen to you, read to them, and narrate back often what they hear. You increase the attention span. You're usually into good, solid chapter books with very few or no pictures, and they're very happy because they have that great imagination developed over time. You want to continue to minimize the technology in their environment. Uh, obviously, they're starting to go to screens to get information, right? And of course, you know, you want to control and guide, coach that very specifically with kids in this age range of, say, you know, eight and a half, ten, nine to ten and a half, eleven, that zone. With speaking now, you can get into presentation of memorized information. So kids can learn poems and then recite it for other people. This ups the quality because they have to practice. They have to develop that skill. They have to kind of refine and prepare in a way that they wouldn't necessarily if they weren't performing it for an audience. And the audience could be peers. You could get together with a couple other families. Kids memorize poems. And once a week, you get together. Everybody says a poem for everybody. You know, it takes half an hour or whatever, and then you can go have popcorn and play Ultimate Frisbee and make it something to look forward to. If you're a teacher in a classroom, you've kind of got a great built-in audience right there. And so you can schedule presentations. One of the things that I am very much concerned, though, is that people understand the value of maintaining the repertoire of memorized poetry. So rather than learn a poem, recite it, forget it, learn another poem, recite it, forget it, learn another poem, recite it, forget it, and doing that all year, at the end of the year, how many poems do you know? One, right? What's a better way to go? Learn a poem, recite it, and then keep reciting it often enough, not necessarily for an audience, but keep reciting it often enough that you don't forget it. So you have spaced repetition that allows for um, more permanent memory. I learned some poems as a child that I have known my whole life. I've said them often enough 
that I have never forgotten them. And one of them I find was, in retrospect, I think, well, when I was a kid, I thought, that's so cool. But now I understand how it was a very significant vocabulary building thing. I'm going to recite the poem for you. I want you to try and figure out what it is. You ready? Scintillate, scintillate, globule vivific. Fain would I ponder thy nature specific. Loftily poised in ether capacious. Strongly resembling a gem carbonaceous. Do you recognize this? No, I'll sing it for you. <laughs> I'll sing it. You'll get it now. Scintillate, scintillate, globule vivific. Fain would I ponder thy nature specific. Loftily poised in ether capacious. Strongly resembling a gem carbonaceous. Somebody did that. I, did. I don't know who did it. But think about my vocabulary, right? Capacious, scintillating, right? Carbonaceous. Like, where are these words going to come into your brain? Except through poetry. So poetry has this amazing power. And kids this age can really suck it up fast. This is the age where they can memorize quickly because they have the power of the growing brain and absorbent mind of youth, but they're sophisticated enough they can do pretty advanced types of things. And they may not understand everything perfectly, right? But I don't understand everything perfectly, right? So you could memorize a Shakespeare sonnet and not understand it, and it would still be valuable, right? Uh, the other thing I've noticed about kids this age is they start to tend to like competition, right? And so you can get into a poetry recitation contest, right? There's an organization called Poetry Out Loud that has a national competition. I think the top prize was in the dozens of thousands of dollars scholarship. And it was basically for, I think, middle school and high school kids reciting poetry. So you could start a little poetry recitation contest for you and your friends or your community or whatever you've got and get the kids preparing and working even harder uh, for a competition. Then with reading, of course, uh, you are trying to give them more opportunity to um, decode on their own. But don't ever stop reading out loud to children. There's another thing I've heard schools, I've heard people say the teacher said, when your kids can read, don't read to them anymore. Because if you do, they won't want to read on their own. And that's not true at all. In fact, the number one predictor of adults who like to read is having been read to a lot as a, children, as a child. So you always want to continue reading out loud and using audiobooks at a comprehension level higher than their own decoding level. This is actually it pulls up comprehension. So they just read the drivel that they can read, and that's all they read. There's not going to be anything pulling up with a higher level of vocabulary, more sophisticated sentence structures, and complex ideas. Um, another thing I think is super good to start to introduce around this age is kids reading aloud to you or each other. You want your children to have the ability to read aloud well, right? And to do it, you've got to create a structure where they get to practice that. Uh, in our case, because we homeschooled and the kids were home all day, uh, it was very convenient to say to an older child, your job on your checklist of things you must accomplish is read to a younger sibling for 20 minutes. So they go to the bookshelf, pull out a picture book, read for a while, and that's great. It, it builds a little relationship there, keeps two kids out of mom's hair for 20 minutes. That's super valuable. But it engenders that skill of them reading aloud. Uh, sometimes uh, my children would do chores, and, and everybody hated dishes, right? So the week that you were dishes, this was the worst week of the month. But you know, you had to suffer like every kid did. And so I would sometimes say, you know, uh, tell you what. If you, while you're doing the dishes, I'll read to you. Or if you prefer, I'll do the dishes if you'll stand here and read to me. Well, they'd usually take the deal. And then I would just wash the dishes very slowly, <laughs> milk it for all it was worth, right? Um, then, of course, with writing, this is really where you can get into teaching composition. This is where you can do more writing. You've got a good, solid foundation. They're starting to be more creative and expressive. And so you're beginning composition. I, of course, have some very strong opinions about the best way to get going with <laughs> composition. Uh, mainly, remember when I was talking about you can start with ideas inside the brain or immediate. You can start with ideas that are in words or not in words. 
the best way is to start with things that are right here, not dependent on memory or imagination, and exist in words, which is how we begin with our source text and keyword outlines and then move on from there. Uh, you probably now have moved into a point where you would have a spelling program of some sort so that you're working your way through the orthography of the English language system and they're learning all the various combinations of weird things that we have to do to learn to spell in English. And again, there are some maybe better and worse ways to do that. The, pro the biggest problem is that kids need vary varying levels of repetition, right? Some children can, you know, they can do it or hear it or see it 10 times they got it for life. Other kids may need three, four, five, ten times that much repetition. So, and then this also is a time you would start to teach grammar. Now, I have seen people try to teach grammar in first or second grade classes, and I am not sure this is really a good use of time. I don't think it would harm anyone, but really grammar is a pretty abstract idea. You have these things called words, and then they're divided into these categories called parts of speech, and you're trying to get kids to identify this. And when they're below this level of concrete thinking and they're just too young, sometimes it just doesn't take. Or they can memorize stuff, but you know there's no application, so it, it kind of disappears. And a lot of children you know, will say, I don't like grammar. Why? Well, it was probably taught in not the best way, at, at, or more likely, at a wrong time. And so they got this dislike of this thing. So I would say, again, better to wait a little too long to start teaching grammar than to start too early and potentially cause a dislike of the thing that doesn't make any sense. Uh, but uh, we can teach grammar. We, of course, have our fix-it grammar, which is kind of on the applied side. And that system works very well because it's a very short amount of time each day. And as you've, you've noticed, there's one thing children like the most about schoolwork. What's that? Being finished. That's what they like the most. So if you do more frequent, shorter things, they get to be finished faster and more often, which makes them happier. So our fix it is designed to be a very short amount of time, one or two sentences each day, with a very specific list of things to do, and it starts super simple and increases incrementally in a very gentle way. And uh, I have heard of people say, well, my son hated grammar when we did the blah, blah, grammar, but now he loves grammar because of fix it. And that's not an uncommon thing to hear. I would also suggest there's value in studying a foreign language starting about this age. A lot of us didn't encounter a foreign language till we were you know, in high school or something. But the benefit of starting in the younger age is, well, you've got that better memory. You've got a little more time in your life. And oddly, the best language, I believe, to study when you're young is Latin. Now, a lot of people say, well, nobody speaks Latin. Yes, that's why it's such a good language to study. You don't have to sit around and pretend you're going to learn to talk Latin, right? the way people take Spanish and pretend they're going to talk Spanish. Well, how many of you took two or three or four years of a foreign language and can't have a three-sentence conversation with anybody? You, you know, if you're going to learn to talk it, you better go to that place or bring someone there and live with them for six months. Then maybe you got a chance of learning to speak in that language. The benefit of Latin, though, is number one, it's the core of the other Romance languages. So if you are going to learn Spanish, Latin's the best foundation you could have, or Italian, or Romanian, or even really English vocabulary, right? French. Another benefit of Latin is that it is very organized. And so when you study Latin, you're not learning how to communicate in the modern world in Latin. What you're learning is the structure of language itself. And you meet a lot of people who say, I learned more grammar from taking German in college than I ever did in English class. I will tell you, I learned more grammar from teaching Latin for six years and just learning along with the kids, because I didn't know it before I started, than I did from teaching English for the 20 years before that. Right? So there's that, there's that idea of, oh, this is something different. Now I need to know what are these things called and what are the rules that govern their behavior. You don't need to know English grammar to speak English. You don't know how you speak English, but you've done it perfectly for a very long time. So you take a little kid and say, son, I'm going to teach you how you use English. Doesn't make any sense to him. 
It's like saying, son, sit down. I want to give you a little lecture on how you ride a bike. Um, Dad, I know how to ride a bike. Yes, you do. But you don't know how you do it. <laughs> you need to know all the biology and physics that makes bike riding possible. Kids like, what's the point? Can I just go ride my bike? All right. But if you study the foreign language, then you don't already know everything. Now you have a need to know. And I think your upper elementary, fourth, fifth grade is a perfect time to start that process. All right, middle school. Now things start going pretty quickly. Again, everything's the same, but just higher levels. Um, with listening, you can teach middle school students how to take notes from what they're listening to. So if you are a family that attends church uh, often enough, uh, taking notes during a homily or sermon can be very good practice. Or there are maybe YouTube videos or little documentary films that you could use for the specific purpose of a child listening or watching and taking notes as they go. And if you're using our writing program, you will know how to use key words to make outlines. You can easily transfer that into listening and taking keyword outlines from what you hear. And you get much better notes because you're not trying to write down too much. So there's an efficiency. Our system beats every other note taking system I've seen anybody try to use in the last 20 years. Um, continuing with audiobooks, very, very valuable. With speaking now, you can get into um, longer poems and even excerpts of famous speeches. You know, there are things that every American used to know once upon a time, right? I mean, once upon a time, pretty much any person who finished eighth grade would know Longfellow's poem, A Psalm of Life, by heart. They would be able to uh, recite the preamble to the Constitution, uh, very possibly the first sentence of the Declaration of Independence or the entire Gettysburg Address. These were things that everybody universally committed to memory. And so it had a linguistic value as well as a culturally bonding value and an historical value as well. So in our poetry program, we have five levels for our poems. And they get a little bit longer and a little more sophisticated as you go up the level. And then level five is 20 excerpts from famous speeches that can be memorized by children. Also, kids this age tend to thrive on contests, things like 4-H. They have speaking and writing aspects to their competitions. Uh, National History Day, nhd.org. That is a very um, extensive opportunity. Kids can uh, write and deliver a speech. They can write a paper. They can create a PowerPoint presentation. They can create a documentary film. They can do boards like for a science fair. And the idea is they're going to be able to um, learn to communicate history ideas in these various ways. And I will tell you, you can be the best teacher in the world, and you can threaten or cheerlead your kids all day and all night, but you will never get out of them as much effort as they themselves will commit when they're preparing for a competition. Competition is, for many kids, a, 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 is, is magnitudes more effective in motivating them to strive, motivating them to work hard. Um, with reading, of course, now the kids are reading a lot more on their own. And you want to push them towards the better literature, the more challenging stuff. I think a good rule to follow is C.S. Lewis's rule about reading. I actually try to follow this rule myself. I've heard it a couple different ways. I'm just going to tell you the way I have lived it. And uh, the way I heard it originally, C.S. Lewis said, you should read one old book for every new book. Right? And so if you read a new book, well, next one, you should pick an old one. Well, OK, what's old, what's new? I just kind of arbitrarily decided if the author is dead, it's an old book. <laughs> so ironically, C.S. Lewis himself wrote old books. <laughs> right? And then kids are always asking, well, when is J.K. Rowling's going to die? You know, so <laughs> when can we read that one? But this idea of you know having a balance and giving due attentiveness to the value of older literature, and then trying to continue to get the kids to read out loud to you or to others uh, or to grandparents. I'm looking forward to this. 
Uh, and then when you're writing, this is the time you absolutely maximize English composition. This is the best time to just push it, do as much as you can, spend as much time as you can get away with. They're young enough to have fun and be imaginative, and they're old enough to learn the best ways to do things. They can have a mastery of grammar and language, but it's still going to be a little goofy because, let's face it, 12-year-olds are all a little awkward. So you're not expecting it all to be perfect. Awkwardness is normal for the developmental period. But in terms of volume and increasingly good quality, you really see the greatest growth during this time period. And you want to continue your study of grammar and, and Latin. Um, I would not say two years is even close to a good amount of Latin. I would say get in on you know grade four or five and plan to do Latin for about six years. And then you'll get the greatest long-term benefits from doing it. And then if you want to pick up Chinese or Spanish or some other language, uh, you know, in addition to Latin, that's just going to help each other. The, the more different language things that you get into your brain, the more connections you make. And then uh, logic is on this list of things to improve writing in middle school students. That seems a little odd because you would kind of relegate logic to either math or philosophy, right? That's where you would find it, say, in a college catalog. But why wouldn't we want to teach logic to middle schoolers? I'm sure you've read something written by a kid, and you think, well, that just uh, <laughs> really doesn't work. That just doesn't make sense. Why? Well, they need to develop a sense of logical thinking and what is a syllogism, what are premises and a conclusion, and what, what makes an argument valid or not valid. I will warn you, though, as soon as you teach a 13-year-old logic, <laughs> They will use it against you. So you have to be prepared. But overall, it's a huge benefit. And just think, what would happen in our world today if every seventh, eighth, and ninth grader had three years of study of logic, like a book that said logic on the cover and taught them reasoning and validity? The politicians would, would be completely out of business. right? Nobody could say stupid things in public and get reelected. Wouldn't that be nice? Yes. So we start. We will be the pioneers of <laughs> returning logic to education. All right. Now, the last one we have here is high school. And in my mind, this is all about integration. My thinking here is you look at those things which teenagers can do that will integrate their listening, speaking, reading, and writing skills in the most effective and efficient ways possible. Number one on the list would be speech and debate. There is nothing I know of that is more um, effective at forcing kids through the motivation of positive peer pressure and competition, having to listen to each other, having to read critically and read well, having to process information, be able to take notes, be able to then stand up and speak well, being able to write their cases and briefs, and be organized. This, this, is, this is the highest and best thing that I know of. Now, some kids are a little hesitant. Well, they're shy. They don't want to go and stand in front of people and do speech and debate. But I've seen hundreds of times kids who are hesitant, and mom said, you're doing it anyway. And after one season of competition, when does debate start? Right? When do I get back to a tournament? So it, you know, there's that getting over it. But kids often intrinsically know those things that make them stronger and will try to do those things if they have opportunity and, of course, support for them to be successful. Um, teaching logic and then moving into rhetoric and getting into Socratic conversation also is requiring the reading, writing, speaking, um, thinking well. A lot of kids love drama, musical theater. These are, also, these are very good because they require huge chunks of memorized repertoire. They connect very often with a period of history. They um, require a lot of mastery so that you can stand on stage and with all the distraction of everything going on, say what you're supposed to say. And that's a great training for the, for the brain. Um, I am a big fan of uh, kids doing dual enrollment or dual credit programs where they can be in high school and at 15 or 16 also take college classes and be able to then, you know, take one class, put it on high school transcript if you have to, but put it on a college transcript and, and have transferable credits. I know any number of kids, more than I have fingers and toes. I have met kids who finished high school at 18 or 19 with two years or more of college credits, an associate's degree 
or more. It's very, very doable, very, very possible. And as you may have noticed, if you've had any interaction with colleges recently, the standards for universities have been declining fairly rapidly. So it's not as though the rigor level is too high for most kids of 15 or 16 who can read and write and calculate decently well. Then, of course, uh, we also have things like teaching younger children. This is one of my favorites. You get a good teenager who knows something. Maybe they're a good writer. Maybe they love books. Maybe they're an artist. Maybe they're a musician. And then you say, OK, let's start a little book club for kids that are three or four years younger than you. Let's start a little writing club or do a writing camp. Right? We have, I have lots of knowledge of teenagers at 16 or 17 who are teaching writing classes using our system for children that are 10, 11 years old. And what a better way to learn something. Everyone knows the best way to learn something is teach it. So set up opportunities like that. And then, of course, any kind of thing that gets kids interacting with adults in a meaningful way. What every 13, 14 year old in the world wants more than anything else is real, honest to God, meaningful life and death responsibility. And the way you experience that is doing things with adults that require you to be your best. You have to listen. You have to speak well. You have to read carefully. You have to be able to write in some cases. What are those things? Starting a business, a little family business, community involvement, internships, political campaigns, missions trips, things like that. Um, I, I will tell you one last story, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, this, this girl in Texas, uh, she's a homeschool kid, so she had time. And at 17 years old, she volunteered for the campaign of a Texas um, House candidate, right, a, a state representative from her district, and he won. And he was so impressed with this kid, he actually hired her to be his communication liaison with his constituents. So she started editing his newsletters and writing stuff for the website, and she had like a full-time job working for this you know, state representative in Texas while she was still in high school because she had shown that she could do it and she loved it. I don't know what she's up to now, but I would assume good things. So those are a few ideas for high school integration. But I think what you want to get out of the whole thing here is that wherever you are with your children, and even if your children are all old, remember, you're going to have to coach them how, what to do with your grandchildren because they, they will realize they don't know everything and they will need your good advice. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, wherever you are with kids or whoever you happen to teach, if you're in a classroom, hopefully you can get this and say, aha, now I see the importance of cultivating all of these language arts, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, and some ways to efficiently uh, and naturally, organically do that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.